seeing him yet. Maybe I missed him. Okay, we're, we're talking about the um, free diving classes. He Where believed- we were. Cam's going to be on here. There he is. Okay, so we were, pick- we were talking about the free diving classes mm-hmm. and how you feel like anybody can get to three minutes and 66 feet mm-hmm. after just a little bit of instruction. Yeah, basically a day and a half class. And it's, it really is eye-opening. Uh, you know, I, I grew up spearfishing. My family spearfished. All of our extended family from the Cayman Islands spearfished. So we just grew up doing it. And we didn't have any technique. We just powered through it. And mm-hmm. I didn't take the class till I was probably in my mid-30s. And I was like, nobody's teaching me anything about free diving. I mean, we've been diving 100 foot since we were kids. And the first day of the first class, I was like, holy cow, how are we alive? <laughs> like, just the, the smoothness of the way that the instructor dive and, and the way he showed us how to do it and the way to do the breathing. I was like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe we didn't we didn't do this. And it it's pretty amazing. And it's nice to have raw talent, like people that have never done it and don't really have any bad habits, it's really nice to teach them, but that's a part of being a, a good teacher is the challenge of also being able to teach an old dog, you know, who's stubborn, you mm. know? So, but yeah. it, it, it's How important do you think it is, what about like breath hold uh, in particular, how important is, uh, you know, physical conditioning to the length of breath hold? Does that does that translate? Like if you're in better shape, you're probably going to be able to learn a little faster or is it all about technique? It's a combination for sure. It's a, it's a balance. Um, obviously the better shape you're going to be in, the less fatigued you're going to get. Um, you know, I'm, I couldn't go out and run a couple miles, but I can out swim anybody. Like I can swim all day. It's just the way my muscles are in my legs. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, if you're able to, to be in, in relatively good shape, like anybody that bikes or runs or does a cycle or whatever, like they're, they're going to be fine. Um, you know, and your body is used to straining itself and then relaxing, straining itself and relaxing. Cause that's what you're doing all day long. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I did, uh, ask or, or told people that, um, I was going to leave a little bit of time for some questions. I have some questions I'd like to just kind of fire at you real quick and uh, you can spend as much time or as little time. And I'd want to leave time for some people to ask questions since this is our first uh, live Instagram podcast inspired by you, by the way, Mm -hmm. I love what you're doing with your, your, with uh, the evening things. Very disappointed that you didn't get Mark the shark on yet. Has that happened or did I miss it? Or (sighs) I haven't done it yet. He's such a pain. (laughs) He's, he's a piece of work. Well, I had, he was on this (laughs) podcast too. It was, uh, it was the most controversial, the most popular, the most shared podcast of any of them that we've done. Good. Um, he's he's a he's a very interesting guy. I actually yes. quite enjoyed spending some time with him. He's not uh, despite man. what you think of him, <laughs> dude. The yeah. guy works four hundred. I mean, he's he takes four hundred trips a year. How do you yeah. not learn something? He, he's spending four hundred days a year. Anyway, this one's not about Mark the Shark. <laughs> I, I just uh, I just kind of saw your stuff, and uh, I thought what you were doing on Instagram Live was really cool. I thought we'd try it here too. So, um, okay. So, what do you think about competitive spearfishing? I know that you've had a you've had a background in that. Um, is that a thumbs up or thumbs down? I'm here with it. Okay. You know, <laughs> I I think that it. It has its place, but I, I'm sad that, that I think that it is kind of, it's, it's been on its way out for a long time and the people that are most involved continue to shoot themselves in the foot with it. So uh, mm. I, it's, it's mostly a thumbs down for me. Okay. That's a very similar kind of feeling to a lot of the fishing tournaments. It, a lot of it goes <clears throat> to the organization and the rules and then the politics that go into it as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, what do you think the cheapest thing that determines success or failure in your business is? Say that again now. What is the cheapest thing? The cheapest thing. Yeah. Is there, is there something I, I could give you an example of, of what I think the You're cheapest thing like that, equipment? that, yeah, yeah. Something that's crucial to your success that is very, uh, cheap. 
it's, easy to find. It sounds simplistic, but your mask, if you don't have the right mask, you're, you got no reason to be in the water. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to say boat plug for me. Uh, <laughs> if I don't have a boat plug, it's not <laughs> happening. Okay. What's your absolute favorite fish to spear and why? Oof. I got to give it a tie with dog tooth tunas and wahoo. Um, mm. I love dog tooth tunas just because I think they're the ultimate challenge. And um, that was the first major world record that I have that was kind of wow. And it held for many, many years. And then I beat it again with another one that just blew everybody out of the water. Um, they are the perfect combination of, it's like having a big yellowfin tuna and a Kubera personality and bodies combined. Mm. Um, you shoot them and they're on the edge of the reef and they dive down 150 feet and wrap up in the rocks or go in a hole and break you off. Um, Wahoo are, everyone is unique. Um, I'm sure you've hunted mutton snappers. They're very similar in that each one has their own personality. And the trick is to be able to look at the whole school of them and be like, that's my bitch and find the right <laughs> one and be able to bring him over. And for me, I'm always patient enough to wait for the big ones um, because when those opportunities come, when you've got a hundred of them there, I'm not going to pull the trigger on the first one. I've had many, many times where that opportunity has come up and I've been like, okay, this is your one chance to shoot the fish of a lifetime. Hold off and try to bring the biggest one to you. And there's just not a lot of people that are patient enough to do that. So I've had... So are, are you right next to them kind of touching their arm like, no, no. Not, not, not yet. It's time. Like, correct. And then it's timing. right there. Oh, it's timing. Yes. Yep. And you can draw but, them. But in can too. you have that kind of communication with them to where you're either oh, yeah. tactile, you're touching them or they can see you all the time. Oh yeah. I've got or a, do you prefer to be behind them? You're talking about the, the client? Your, yeah. Your client. I, I've yeah. got them right beside me and I've got a death grip on their arm and I will not, let them, <laughs> and I will not let them leave the surface. And what I do is I just squeeze when the right one is coming. And it's, that's part of the knowledge that we impart on our clients is how to do that themselves. Cause as much as I would love to be there on, on every trip they do, it's just not realistic. And I tell people, I'm like more so than any fish we're going to get this trip, the amount of knowledge that you're going to get each day is 20, 30 years of trying to figure it out on your own and even diving with other people, because this is our specialty. And I mean, we are, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible to see the jump, in client's skill level, um, even in a mm. very short period of time. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there ever been a, has there ever been a book that you've read that you liked so much that you gave away a copy? Oh yeah. A lot of them. Okay. Um, what's the most gifted book then? Uh, a land remembered. Who wrote that? Do you know? Oh gosh. What's it about? I've never read that book. A Land, a land Remembered. A Land Remembered. Uh, somebody will probably chime in here. And if somebody can look it up while we're doing this. Um, so Land Remembered is about old Florida, basically. And a, okay. a family that after the Civil War moved down to North Florida out in the boonies um, and basically started catching cattle and raising cattle and then how they um, you know, made a nice. living from it through generations. It was pretty, that's what a Florida cracker is. I it learned is. that from, uh, from Patrick Robert Smith. Errington told me the, right. the, the story about why they call them Florida crackers mm -hmm. and the, the whipping, you know, and, and moving the cattle through all old Florida. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. I'll put that one on my list. Yep. Patrick um, Smith is the author. Thanks okay. guys. Who, uh, who is the best spear fisherman in the world that you've never heard of? GR Tar. And who is he? He's a his red tide spearfishing on the west coast of Florida. He's got wow. There was no hesitation there. Yeah, definitely not. He's he's <laughs> one of my my best buddies, and a lot of what I figured out, we figured out together. Or on these long drives, me traveling all over, we just get on the phone and just talk and just figure stuff out. And he's very hands on too. Um, but he he just turned sixty, and I put him up against any diver in the world. He won our nationals last year and beat everybody at 60 years old. He's a nice. phenomenal diver. Like he shot, there's a picture on my Instagram or whatever. His, um, he shot a monster black, probably over a hundred pounds. And all he got back wow. was the head and he shot at 127 feet free diving. Dang. It's like two years ago. Beast. Yeah. He's an That's a animal. Beastly. <laughs> all right. So we've all had in our career getting to getting to whatever point it is that we're, we are in our career. We've all had success. We've all had failure. I know you have. I have. Mm -hmm. What failure 
has taught you the most? Um, judging people, honestly. And, you know, like I said, the only thing that matters for us is that everybody comes back. And I'm honestly, I'm almost able to tell over the phone now. Uh, you know, when you first start a business, you're pretty hungry and you're, you're, you want to take everybody you possibly can. But learning to say no to people is difficult. You know, when you know it's not the right thing, you need to be able to say no. And um, that's how you put yourself in trouble. We call it the race car mentality because we've got some clients that are race car drivers. And it is all the people that we deal with are the absolute elite in whatever business they do. So they're very, very strong personalities and very driven people. Um, I've had so many of them tell me, you are the only person I've ever listened to in my life. <laughs> You know, yeah. and that's very important because I'm the one that's going to help them get home. Um, but it's up to them to want to. And there's some people that just do not have that synapse in their brain that has that self-preservation gene, you know. So you, you got to be able to say no, you know, when you know it's not right. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's when you that's when you know that you're that you're doing pretty well and and you know, the, the outdoor profession, I guess, is when you start being able to pick your clients and just saying, you know what, this is not a good fit. Like mm -hmm. we're going to go out, you're going to catch some fish or you're going to spear fish or whatever. But I really think that somebody else would be better for you. And, and you watch them go with that other person and they have a wonderful relationship mm -hmm. for 10 years. And you're just like, good. Yeah. That was great because it just wasn't going to work out for us for whatever reason, you know, personality wise or whatever you guys are getting, uh, put on a, on a boat, very mm -hmm. close quarters with people. So I would imagine you have to be, um, and international travel and on and on and on mm -hmm. that makes, yeah. you know, tight quarters makes for, uh, uh, we, we have no hours. We're 24 seven with our clients. And I mean, some trips are two weeks. So from dawn till dusk and through the night, like if they want to do something, we're ready to roll. So personality is very key. And, uh, you know, like you said, you, you, um, recommend a client to, to somebody else. I've got three other guys that work with me and I love these clients to death, but just personality wise and the way they like to do things, they'll end up being career clients for, you know, the guys that work with me and that's fine. Right. You know, cause yeah. all in the end, I just want everybody to have fun. Right. Yeah. Good attitude. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's one thing that the spearfishing community does not know about you? Oh, <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty open. Um, gosh, I don't even know. Okay. I'm have well, to come back to you're, that one. you're an open book. All right. Probably, so. probably much about my wife, to be honest. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cause I keep uh, her uh, under wraps pretty good. Okay. Well, speaking of that, um, you, you just had your two children there mm -hmm. has becoming a father, um, changed your risk assessment or your, your, your risk tolerance at all. Yeah, for sure. I've always got something in my mind, you know, like, um, I've, I've always had that preservation gene, you know, where I want to come home. Mm -hmm. Um, and the number one rule in free diving is don't dive alone, but there's been opportunities many times over the years where I dove alone. It just wasn't feasible. Um, and then when I started dating my wife and I knew there was no way I was ever going to upgrade from this, I didn't want to blow that. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd be down and I'd have a chance at a fish and be like, you know what? this is not worth it. Let's go up. There'll be another chance for that, but a second here or there will make a big difference. Um, when I first, you know, started going on these trips, when I had my kids, I would take, and I still do, I take something of my kids with me every day. Mm -hmm. And I usually put it on my, on my knife. So that it's on my weight belt. So I'm constantly there touching it. And it's just a good reminder. And it shows yeah. the clients too, like, Hey, you know, he wants to come back. You, you right. know, you want to come back too. I love that. That's so, that's so cool. Um, okay. So, uh, I want to leave time for a couple of questions from, from the people here. So we'll, we'll get to one. Chris mm -hmm. H Jarrett says, what tips do you have for getting from spearing in 70 to 80 feet of water to a hundred to 120? That's level two class for sure. Um, and again, contact me for that because all these, the majority, all the free dive classes were written for free divers. Um, we teach it for spearfishing. So we teach the same content, but we teach more body positioning and how to hunt and incorporate that, which is 
two different kind of skill sets because being a strong free diver is only so valuable. You've got to be a strong spear fisherman too. Like you got to be a good hunter. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to know before we get to uh, other questions is you're going international trips. You're, you're doing something that is extremely dangerous. You're taking people with a variety of skill levels and interest levels, probably. Um, what kind of, uh, medical do you have? Are you like an EMT or, or do you have any sort of, of medical Lots. background? Lots. Yeah. So from working on the ships, like when I stopped working on the ships, the last five years that I worked, I was a captain. So, um, basically I have a license that I can captain anything that floats. Um, you, I have, I have a list of certifications like this from, you know, fork truck driver to crane operator <laughs> and <clears throat> about this much of it is medical stuff because when you're on a ship, if something happens and you're between right. China and, and California, you're it, you know, you got to deal with it. So I have had a lot of it and we do trauma training as, as well with our, um, with our other guides. So everybody is trained up on that. Um, our big challenges are, you know, boat strikes. If somebody ever got hit by a boat or a prop, um, yeah. then obviously shark bites and getting stuck or something, allergic reactions, all that stuff. So everybody, no matter what you do in life, should have at least some basic classes. Sure. Are there ever um, places that are so remote? Like when, I mean, you have, you know, a 150-foot boat can go pretty much anywhere, I would mm -hmm. imagine. There's, there's, I mean, you're, you're with people who have boats that could absolutely go anywhere mm -hmm. does it ever get so far out that you start factoring in okay well there's going to be no medical opportunity here we always have a, we have a plan so that's one of the assessment we do like a risk assessment and yeah. the clients always have have an out um, and we've done it with the bahamas a lot as well and there's our big and this is something for everybody whether you're fishing or diving in the Bahamas or when you're far out, you need to be able to make the decision, okay, is it better for me to go to the Bahamas right now or even if it's 120 miles, to just start hauling ass back to the US and call the Coast Guard on the way. And generally that is a better call is to start running back to the US and call the Coast Guard because they can come out a lot farther to pick you up. And in the Bahamas, man, it's, it's scary. Like when I, mm. I cut my finger off in the Bahamas and I walked out of the the uh, the emergency room, and because I mean I felt like I was going to bleed to death. Right. It was it was pitiful, and I stopped so bleeding and everything. Yeah. It's just better to to make the run back, mm -hmm. get to Miami or or Fort Lauderdale or wherever your port is. In mm -hmm. some cases, yeah, I can see that. Um, one question here: What kind of dry, dry land training can you do to imp improve your breath hold? Just stand in good shape. Biking, running, anything like that is, is going to help. Um, you can research online breathing tables, um, and there's some apps to help mm -hmm. your breathing. But honestly, being in good shape, being able to relax in the water, doing yoga, and doing that deep diaphragmatic breathing helps immensely. Hmm. That's cool. Except don't do that around the water, right? Yeah, don't don't ever train in it's the water. It's always been the the majority of deaths are in the pool. So never never train in the pool unless you're with another certified free diver buddy. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, I had um, one of my friends, Toby Hansen. He asked what your dream fish would be to spear. It big or small doesn't matter. Is there is there a fish that has eluded you or one that is particularly attractive to you big eye tuna big eye tuna so one of, one of and, my goals this year is this is a challenge because i don't get that many opportunities to actually spear because i'm usually guiding but <clears throat> one of my goals this year is to shoot a big eye with a pole spear mm, with um, a pole spear yeah. wow that's awesome so we've had <laughs> i've had clients shoot two or three of them big ones like the smallest one i think was 150 or 180 um and we had Another client shoot a 282, and I had one come up in the chum a couple years back that I thought was every bit of like 275, 280, and I chummed him <clears throat> for 45 minutes until I ran out of chum, and the clients missed him seven times. Oh. And the I think the video is up on my, my YouTube, but it was here actually in Ascension, so you can see how blue the water is around this sailfish. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was so painful. Like, they missed him so many times, and the, I 
was talking about this uh, the other night on the podcast. Like I came to the surface and I was crying at the end of it. <laughs> They're like, I'm so <laughs> oh, sorry. I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I know the feeling. It, it, it seems like that would be, you know, you can have the same feeling with a, with a, a eight pound permit when, yeah. when the thing is just dying to eat the fly in front of the boat. And, mm-hmm. and it's just like, I mean, you could literally throw it out there with your hand and they don't get it for whatever so, reason. So here's a question for you. So having spent a lot of time both in shallow and deep water, do you think permit are a deep water fish or a shallow water fish? I think they're a deep water fish that has a shallow water behavior. Mm-hmm. I think that they, uh, that's, that's a learned behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, just like the mutton snapper. I think the mutton snapper is a learned behavior too. They, they go up there and they can, they can eat on the flat. That's probably not where they're the most comfortable, which is why they're hard to catch and really spooky because mm-hmm. they're, they don't have a hydrodynamic body like a bonefish. Mm-hmm. Like a bonefish is obviously a fish that is probably more comfortable in shallow water than deep water, even though you catch mm-hmm. them in deep water and you catch them in shallow water. But it just seems like that is one that has just you know, is perfectly designed for, for the shallow water Mm -hmm. where the permit, it still looks like an offshore fish. That's just up in really shallow water. So you wouldn't think that a a fish that lives up on the flats would be that dark either. Like with that, the top fin and everything. And we see, and you do as well. I mean, you guys fish the heck out of them. I cannot tell you how many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands we see on the reef in caves out in the blue water, like, it's, I think it's a rarity that they come up on the flats and it's, yeah. that's one of the allures for you guys is, okay, Hey, this is such a cool fish already. They're so powerful. When you hook them, they are going to get off this flat and go back to where they want to be. Right. Yeah. They're my favorite fish by far. Um, I think just because I started in Key West and that was just the kind of the target destination for people to go down there. So they were already hard to catch. And so if you came back and you didn't catch any, it was no big deal. So mm-hmm. as a very rookie guide, I was like, well, that's a good one for me to go for because they're, you know, did you catch any? Nope. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was cool, you know? So I, I honestly, it took the pressure off fishing for a fish like that, mm-hmm. where some people would be like, man, that's the fish that you decided to go for. <laughs> but like, for me, it was like no pressure because very few people caught them. And so if you didn't catch one, it wasn't like, you know, you go tarpon fishing and everybody catches three or four mm-hmm. and you catch zero day after day after day. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always thought it was less pressure, but, uh, but I love them. I just think that they're, uh, they're a very interesting fish. They all got different personalities. You approach each of them a little bit differently based upon the behavior that you see very much like spear fishing. Mm-hmm. Like, like you're talking about the Wahoo, like that's the one right, right there. That's the one, that's the one that keeps doing this little, little turn and here's the way I'm going to get him. I mean, it's the same kind of thing with permit. It's like mm-hmm. you look out there on some of them and you're just like, not even, not even worth trying. That thing is so edgy <laughs> that, that we're never getting close to him where this one coming down here is so stupid. <laughs> we're definitely going to catch it, yeah. <laughs> but you don't sometimes, you know? So but, here, uh, here's the next question. When's the last time you kept one? Uh, the last time the tail got bit off of one by mm. a, by a shark, which is, kind of, you know, it happens regularly, but you know, uh, you know, a little lemon shark or something that comes in can bite the tail off of a permit. I mean, and that's usually where they take them out at the motor mm-hmm. and then I always keep them and mm-hmm. they're very good, but I, I, I don't keep them if, you know, just, just for keeping them. Mm-hmm. There are other fish. I just catch a few snappers on the way home and, and Which, we'll be good. I think I already know the answer to this cause this is a, a total keys mm. fish, but what are your thoughts on spear and permit? Uh, well, I would imagine that they'd be pretty easy to spear, Mm -hmm. uh, just with my experience of swimming with a few. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I think about that. I think that, uh, there's a big controversy right now about, you know, the Western dry rocks and what's going on out there and just this complete protection. And I don't even know where I stand on that quite honestly, Mm -hmm. because I don't think that the, you, you have, you have, um, I mean, the flats guides are not going to like what I have to say, but you have, you have, uh, you know, some data who knows if you, you don't have the other side providing data. So the data could be very one-sided. I don't know. I think that, that it's a very emotional issue because both the offshore fishermen that want to fish at Western dry rocks 
love the permit. They want to catch them. It's a big part of what they do. The flats guides obviously love the permit to a point of being um, like a religion. And so you have differing opinions and, but both parties want to protect the fish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Do I think that you could spear permit? I mean, if you, if you um, have a limit on them that is sustainable, one per vessel per day, you know, I guess, you know, that I, mean, I think that the fishery, that you always have to be fair to all people, all fishermen, because, you know, if you if you completely exclude the commercial fishermen or you have the bait guys versus the fly guys or the spear fishermen versus the the conventional fishermen, you know what? Generally, the fishermen lose mm -hmm. because you're getting your take. Well, there's not a lot of us anyway. We all want to protect the fish so that we can keep doing what we love to do. And then if you split us into these little groups, it's very easy for somebody to come out there and just say, well, you know what? We can, we can have it our way, right. which is we want to catch all of these. Or the law enforcement says, you know what? There's no way we can enforce what kind of fly these guys are throwing. There's no way we can enforce what kind of you know, spear these guys are using or how many. We're just going to close it down. Because we don't have enough law happens. enforcement to do what we want. So I don't know. You know, I think it's, I don't like closure. I think that once things close, you rarely get them back. back. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at Bahia Honda, I mean, not Bahia Honda, um, um, Boca Chica Beach. You know, when I first started fishing in Key West, you could fish all the way up and down Boca Chica Beach. Now, they, you, you would think that you were committing a felony if you went there and threw a cast net or whatever really? yet um jet skis run up and beach themselves on the on the on the bar and and it's just a weird thing but they closed that down and said we're going to do fish counts here and we will reopen this when the fish counts show that we should which in my opinion i mean there's never ever been another word about reopening boca chica beach not one and we just lost it and so I don't think that that was the result that anyone wanted. And I, and I don't think that if they just closed Western dry rocks to fishing entirely, that that's the result that anyone wants. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just think that we all ought to try to get together, understand what each other's, um, what each other, what each group wants, and then try to figure out how that's a sustainable way to, to move on. Right. And sometimes it's not. Like sometimes fishing, fishing methods are too effective and you, you just, you're going to eliminate the species like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Yeah. It's a what do you think about spear and permit? Um, we shoot them. I mean, there's, it's a good eating fish. Uh, as far as I can see, you know, the numbers of them are, are good. Um, it seems like they repopulate pretty darn well and we just do it within reason, you know, and mm -hmm. m majority of the time we pass them up. And we you tell the clients, like, look, if you really want one, you can get one, but we're going to get other fish. There's other stuff that's better eating. These things fight hard, and you got to make the call. If there's Goliaths around, they're going to get them. Mm. Um, you know, you can, if there's a school of APs, African Pompano and Permit on the same wreck, nine out of 10 Permit are going to get eaten by a Goliath or by a shark. The sharks are not afraid of them. The APs, though, when you shoot those, the Goliaths, don't usually get them and the sharks won't eat them. We've only had like <laughs> one per, uh, AP ever eaten. Um, Isn't that funny? Yeah, how I that, I mean, of them. it's a weird, it's a funny thing though. Like there's just like certain baits, like you put down a certain bait and the, and a fish won't, won't bite it, but you put down another one that's slightly different, mm -hmm. like a blue runner versus a, you know, something else. And then, and, and they just like a blue runner versus a Jack Gravel, you get bit on a blue runner, like immediately. But if you put down a little Jack Gravel about the same size, eh, not not so much, you know, in a lot of places. And I don't know what that is or, or why. Um, what do you think about the lionfish situation? It's so far out of control. There, it's There's obviously no way to ever stop it. Like, it started with whatever, one or a half a dozen of them. It's unstoppable. Um, I've unfortunately been hit twice by them. It is not fun. Um, now, when you say you got hit by them, you're free swimming mm -hmm. and get hit or you you spear one and you're, you're getting it back in the boat or putting it in the cooler or something. And, and you get free hit. swimming. The, the most recent, really time, the most recent time I got hit, I was getting a big grouper out of a hole in the Bahamas. And as I was pulling the, the fish out, he pulled me and there was a lionfish right there. Oh. And it went into my, my shoulder here. 
Um, and the first time I got it, I was filming a client and I was down coming down to the bottom and I was like, Oh, and I hadn't even hit the bottom yet. And I looked and I was like, Oh, come on. And that one hit me like right here in the, in the wrist. Mm. Let me tell you that sucked. It, it so was, what do you do? The number one thing to do is to put as hot a water as you can possibly take on it. Kind of like a stingray. Um, and then like take Tylenol or Benadryl or something like that. But that one, because it was so close to all the veins and blood vessels and everything, holy cow, it, it, it screwed me up, man. I was sick for like probably 12 hours. Um, wow. It, it sucks. Yeah, I've heard of people kind of like kind of like the COVID-19 thing. Some people are getting very sick. Other people, not so much. I've heard the same thing with the, with the lionfish stings that some people like, I know one guy almost lost his hand and, uh, I don't, I don't know if he just got MRSA in there as well as the lionfish sting, but he really had a hard time with his hand. Other people I hear, you know, it, it really hurt, but you know, it, no, it no danger. It definitely depends losing. on where they hit you and with what fins and how bad, you know, um, both, the ones that hit me were not very big ones. They were only this big. And I mean, the second time the one that hit me in the shoulder, I was like totally prepared. I was on a 53 hydro sport and I said, go boil water. <laughs> so we had like as hot a water as I could take. And I took a bunch of Tylenol and it was fine. I dove through the rest of the day. No worries. But that first one, I mean, I, I was down for the count for like 12 hours. Yeah. So a, a couple of people were asking what hot water does. And then, uh, Don, the Hasselhoff, said it denatures the poison denatures the protein of the poison which is that was my understanding of what it does too but it makes it stop hurting just like a <laughs> That's just like a stingray <laughs> makes it stop hurting and obviously uh, clean it with soap and water immediately as you should with any of those different things and part of our stuff that we do with kids on our on our trips is we go through like basic boat safety different stuff on the boat to teach them about the boat and for xyz you know shark bite stingray spine lionfish what is the thing to do for that jellyfish mm. or whatever so that they take that knowledge with them and it's it's basically a summer camp for kids you know on mm. on the boat every day oh that's cool that's cool you and and i would imagine that a lot of your clients are bringing their family like mm -hmm. that's this this is their family kind of thing and you you almost become part of the the family just like a lot of the people that i know that work on private private boats like as a fishing guide or just the captain they kind of become part of that mm -hmm. family that's and and i'm sure you have clients that you've been working with for a long time uh that are like family right oh yeah all of them yeah it's, it's... um okay a couple more questions and then i know you gotta you gotta go you're you're mm -hmm. One, one of the things that i didn't read in your resume is i read this long resume and then at the end it says also uh runs homeschool and <laughs> i don't that run homeschool i'm an assistant <laughs> I'm an assistant, assistant teacher. Assistant at that. principal. <laughs> yeah, and janitor. I'm part yeah. of, mostly a janitor. So, of all the things that you've done and all the fish that you've shot, is that easier or harder than being assistant janitor and assistant principal at the homeschool during COVID nineteen? This is way harder. Being assistant <laughs> janitor, <laughs> it's way yeah. way harder. Uh, I'm with you. It's uh. I, I, I was before we before we started. I was telling you my kids are now twenty two, twenty and sixteen. It's a little different having them at home, but um, man, to be cooped up in a house with a couple of a little kids. I mean, are you are getting outside, right? Oh yeah, my wife is as a much saint. as possible. Like she's she's crushing the homeschool thing. So thankfully, I've got her. Yeah, cool. Okay, this last question came in. What's the weirdest object you've seen or found underwater? Oh man, I found a lot of weird stuff. Um, I think the weirdest things um, I found a, I found a, a number of, of good sized shark's teeth like this, like actually mm. in the in the rivers here in Florida, um, like out at our hunting camp. Um, but gosh, the weirdest thing I saw a sawfish the other day, which was pretty wild. Um, that's the first one I've seen in all the millions of dives that I've done. It was giant. It was like fourteen foot. I put the video up on my YouTube. Um, Is that deep water or shallow water? Or how? It was like 85, 90. Really? Mm -hmm. We see quite a few of them. We see quite a few of them in, in shallower water. You know, mm -hmm. they get, they like those channels and stuff and then they'll, they'll get up on the, on the flat mm -hmm. as well. Actually, I thought I had, um, uh, I don't know. It'd probably take too long to find it here, but, uh, I do have a, a drone video of one up on the flat. Um, okay. So what two, two last questions, what's your, uh, definition of a successful trip? 
everybody has the time of their life. You know, I want, I want people to say at the end of the trip, that was the best trip of my life. And I can't tell you how often that happens. And each time we're like, well, we next one, we're going to have to do something better. And we do. Mm. And it's, I, I kid you not, like these people, you know, that we go with are such wonderful humans. Like they've done everything. They've gone around the world. They're very humble and they're all family oriented and they're just looking to have a good time. So they put a lot of trust in us to plan, you know, their yearly adventures with their family and do cool stuff. And it, it creates that constant challenge to do something better, you know? And I, I when I look at trips, I think big, you know, yeah. like when people are like, oh, well, let's go dive. I'm like, all right, but let's like really go dive. Let's really do something cool. And that's what, that's what gives us our edge is, you know, we, we go way beyond, you know, what anybody would ever think. Yeah, man. I mean, I was thinking about that last night when I was talking, thinking about all the different questions I wanted to ask you and things. And one thing that, that struck me is, you know, when I first started guiding in, in Wyoming, I fished on a couple of rivers. And at the time I thought, man, I'll never learn this river as well as mm -hmm. that guy over there. And then the next thing, you know, a couple of years later, you're like, oh, I, I got that river down pretty good. Now I'm going to move and I'm going to find this river and this river and this river. And then you start fishing in the Keys and it's like, oh boy, mm -hmm. I hope I can find Dolphin. my way to the other side of the Northwest Channel, you know? And then, mm -hmm. and then you're like, but Steve Huff, he knows all the Keys and he knows 10,000 islands and how in the world?